So same example, but a different kind of hypothesis. So the, hypo the hypothesis here for number two is that participants will have a higher pain-free range of motion in the understated feedback condition compared to the overstated feedback condition. So what that means is that in the condition where the range of motion that the participants are seeing on their virtual reality headset is lower than their actual range of motion, we think that they'll move more freely compared to the opposite, compared to the condition where the range of motion they're seeing in their virtual reality headsets is a greater range of motion compared to what they're actually doing. So that's a comparison of the understated motion condition to the overstated motion condition. So conceptually here we've got two variables. We've got an independent variable and a dependent variable. The dependent variable is the measure of pain-free range of motion, which is what the actual scores are in the cells in our data set here. And our independent variable is our condition variable, our grouping variable, which has two levels or two conditions, understated versus overstated. And that's a within subjects independent variable because all 24 participants participated in both the understated and the overstated conditions. So but all 24 participants have a score on our DV for the two groups, the two conditions, understated and overstated. So conceptually, we've got an independent variable and a dependent variable. But in our data set, the data is kind of laid out a little bit differently in that we've got, again, two variables in the data set that represent the DV within the two different categories or the two different groups. So understated visual feedback and overstated visual feedback. Those are the two variables in our data set. And just like before, remember that both of them are expressed as a difference from normal. So what you can see is in the understated condition, a lot of people have one point something scores, which means that they moved more than the, than the control condition. Whereas in the overstated condition, a lot of people have point something scores, which means they moved less than the control condition. And we want to directly compare the range of motion between the understated and the overstated conditions. And the analysis that we'll use for that is a paired samples t-test. And the reason that it's a paired t-test is because our two groups are non-independent groups. It's the same score from each person under two different conditions. So rather than being an independent samples t-test, we need to do a paired samples t-test because it's the same people giving us two sets of scores. And that's what we want to do. We want to compare the average score on the understated visual feedback to the overstated visual feedback. So again, talking about assumptions, it's really important to have a look at these, these assumptions and to see whether your data are appropriate for the test in terms of the assumptions that need to be met before you do the test. Because if your data aren't appropriate for the test, then the results of the test aren't actually telling you what you think they're telling you. They're not necessarily accurate or not necessarily meaningful. So that's why we need to check our assumptions before we do any of the tests that we want to run. So the first assumption we're going to talk about here is the normality of different scores. So remember that that assumption of normality, of the, normal, the normality of the distribution of the um, outcome variable, the numeric variable, applies not to the variables themselves, but to the differences between the two scores for each participant. So what we need to do in order to check this assumption is to actually create a new variable in our data set which is representing that different scores, the difference between the two variables that are involved in our paired t-test. And this is the status syntax that we can use to do that. So the generate command is making a new variable. It's the command name to create a new variable. I'm going to be very imaginative and call my new variable diff, standing for difference. And the way that that variable is calculated is it's the difference between our understated group minus the overstated group. So it's the score on the understated condition minus the score on the overstated condition. And that gives us a new variable in our data set, which is representing those differences. And then what we need to do is to check the distribution, specifically the normality of the distribution of that variable. So here's a screenshot of your data set once that variable's been created. So you can see that we have a new variable, diff, and that's just literally the difference between the two numbers for each of our participants. We can use the summarize command to get a numeric summary table of those different scores. So you can see that the mean different score is a positive number. It's 
0.13, but obviously there's quite a range in different scores. And we can also get a histogram of those, those different scores in order to see if the variable is approximately normally distributed. And now you might look at this thinking that the variable is a bit positively skewed, which it is. There's a bit more of a tail of the top end than the bottom end. But what we're looking for here in terms of this assumption being met is whether the variable is approximately normal. It doesn't have to be perfect and it's not going to be perfect when we're looking at real data. But does it look vaguely like a normal distribution? Does it have some central tendency? Is it reasonably symmetrical? Um, is it unimodal? You know, all of those kinds of things. So as well as looking at the histogram, we can use that shapiro wilt test in order to do the significance test of the normality of this variable, which I've done here. And just like before, we can see that the test results here give us a non-significant p-value because the p-value, the last number here, the probability, is 0.249, which is bigger than 0.05, which therefore means that we have a non-significant result. So a non-significant Shapiro-Wilk test means that our assumption is met because our distribution is not significantly different to a normal distribution. So that's good news from that. So again, going back to our assumptions, we know that our outcome variable is on a numeric scale. We can tell that by having information about the experiment, but also by, look, by looking at the data. We know that the different scores are normally distributed because we looked at the histogram and we did the Shapiro-Wilk test. And we also know again through uh, having information about the sampling design that the observations are related across the two groups, but independent across the pairs. So all those three assumptions are met which means that we can proceed to our paired samples t-test. So this is the results of our paired samples t-test. You can see our output on the left-hand side with the syntax, the written out um, code up the top there. So what we can see here is that um, what Stata is doing for us is comparing the average different scores to zero and seeing if they're significantly different from zero, essentially. So just like the interpretation of the previous set of output, we get a t-statistic here with degrees of freedom and we get a p-value down the bottom here in the middle. So what we can conclude here is because we have a significant result, a statistically significant result, and I'm saying that based on the fact that this p-value is less than 0.05, then we know that there's a significant difference in scores and that the direction of that difference mean that people had a greater range of motion, i.e. a higher score, in the understated condition compared to the overstated condition. So our nice little conclusion over the side here is that there's a significantly higher pain threshold, i.e. a greater range of motion, in the understated visual feedback condition than the overstated visual feedback condition. And as well as saying that there's a significant difference, we can also comment on how big the difference is. So we can say there's an, uh, there is on average a 13% increase in range of motion in pain threshold from the overstated to the understated feedback conditions. And that 13% increase is just the difference between the two scores, 13% difference. And our 95% confidence interval, which is where we think that the real population difference is going to lie between, we're 95% confident that that real population improvement in range of motion is somewhere between 7% and 20% increase in range of motion. And again, to calculate the Cohen's D, which is our standardized measure of effect size, we can take that um, actual difference score, that 0.134, divided by the standard deviation around the difference, which is 0.163, I've rounded it to three decimal places, and get a Cohen's D of 0.82, which we know is a large effect. So there's quite a big impact of just manipulating 20% greater movement, 20% less movement, um, in terms of the amount of movement that people see on their virtual reality headsets. Um, that has quite a big impact on their experience of pain or the limitation of pain on their range of motion. And that's a pretty impressive thing. So the next thing I wanted to show you was just showing you an actual write-up of these results from the paper itself um, and to show you how the way that they express these results is really similar to what we just did on the previous few slides. So this is a um, paragraph taken out of their results section. Um, I'll read it out for you, but obviously you can read along yourselves as well. So when vision understated true rotation, 
pain-free range of motion, which remember is our outcome here, was increased, and this was a medium-sized effect, Cohen's D equals 0.67. When vision overstated true rotation, pain-free range of motion was decreased, and this was a large effect, D equals 0.8. Specifically, during visual feedback that understated true rotation, the pain-free range of motion was increased by 6%, and then they quote the 95% confidence interval. During visual feedback that, under, that overstated true rotation, pain-free range of motion decreased by 7%, and then the 95% confidence interval. Therefore, our results show an overall effect of the manipulation of 